everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Now in today's video, we're gonna tackle what is to me a pretty cool thought exercise. We're gonna talk a little bit about what the world would look like in the age after the last battle. So specifically, what would the fourth age look like? Now I will probably make a series out of this depending on how this video goes, but today I'm going to talk about five things that I think will happen in the fourth age of the Wheel of Time. Now before getting to the video, let me give a quick thank you to the video sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN is the top rated provider of VPN services in the world, and there are tons of reasons for you to get a VPN, but we'll talk more about that later in the video. Let's also hit a spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through the very last book of the series, A Memory of Light. Meaning if you have not finished all of the books, click off this video and come back once you have, you are going to be spoiled. So let's go ahead and hop right into my list of five things I think will happen in the fourth age of the Wheel of Time. So one of the things I think that feels tied up all nicely at the end of the books is the Dragon's Peace, which is the agreement between the nations of the Westlands, the Aiel, and the Shanchan Empire. Now, that treaty basically says that those nations will keep their borders for a period of 100 years after the last battle, and that the Aiel will serve as a police force for the treaty. They're going to mediate disputes, and they're going to enforce violations of that treaty. Now, while that sounds good in theory... This agreement is fundamentally flawed in my opinion, and it's based on some very shaky ground. For one, the Shan Chan are so opposed, both in belief systems and in views, to the rest of the continent that I think there is bound to be some type of conflict there. Do you see the Shan Chan allowing the Aiel wise ones to come in and mediate a dispute, considering they can channel? The Shan Chan are also the most powerful political entity and the most powerful military entity in the world at the end of the last battle. Now, I think they would probably lose in an all-out battle against every other nation, but they are stronger than any one group. That is bound to lead to some conflicts. Do you see the Shan Chan that waited all this time to come back to the Westlands with a mandate in their own heads to conquer the entire continent to then stop and wait a hundred years to do what they believe is that mandate? I don't think so. And what about when somebody is captured as a Damani and there's a dispute over that? Maybe it's a former Aes Sedai, maybe one of the kin, and, or maybe someone from some nation and there's a conflict. I don't see the Shan Chan allowing the Aiel to mediate that dispute. They're going to view the Aiel as biased, right? Also, slavery is a major part of their culture, whereas that's not something that's okay for the rest of the Westlands. Again, all these things point to a conflict. And that's just assuming conflicts with the Shan Chan. Due to the nature of people in general, I think there are bound to be disputes and disagreements between nations. And the leaders that signed the Dragon's Peace, they're going to die. A lot of them already have. And so I think their nations are going to feel less bound to follow it. I mean, documents like this litter our history, something that seems like a major accomplishment at the time. But over time, those agreements tend to break and war resumes. Just take a look at the League of Nations or the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. The League of Nations sounded great in theory, and then look what it brought us, World War II. Unfortunately, that's just human nature. I predict the Dragon's Peace will not even make it 50 years, let alone the hundred that it is supposed to exist. So this is something I feel pretty strongly will happen. At the end of the last battle, the Shan Chan are probably in the best shape of any of the nations. They have the least depleted military. The lands that they control in the Westlands are basically untouched by the battle. They've gained weaves of the one power that they did not previously know, like traveling. That's going to reduce the advantages that the other channeling groups of the world had over them. Their leadership is completely intact for the most part, something that is not true for most of the rest of the nations of the world. All of these things would seem to indicate that they are poised to dominate both politically and militarily after the last battle. And initially, I think that's probably true. But there are some major cracks that run deep in their culture and the stability of their government. Let's start with the issue of slavery. Slavery has existed in cultures around our world for millennia, and the use of slavery, though, tends to decline as civilization advances. Now, there's a number of factors as to why that's true, but one of the major ones is the control of information and ideas. With the Shan Chan homeland basically in absolute chaos and the base of their power now in the Westlands, surrounded by other nations that do not agree with them, there's going to be no way for the Shan Chan government to stop access from information and ideas 
from those other nations and from the people that live currently in their own. The idea of freedom or self-determination is going to come up. It always does. And so when that happens, rebellions will start. They're going to have conflicts with other nations, as we've already talked about. Additionally, the major form of slavery we see in the books, the leashing of women that can channel as Damani, that's under fire as well. The fundamental truth that all of the Soldom can learn to channel is now known. That's not a secret anymore. While it's not going to undermine their system immediately, again, they're already justifying that because they choose not to learn, that makes them different. That is a crack in their logic that's going to break down their society eventually, especially as other channelers around the world are seen to be not crazy, not ruling the world, right? They're not dangerous. Maybe they don't need to be leashed. That type of information and ideas are going to break down what it means to be a Shan Chan. Keep in mind, they're already invaders here. And while they seem to have settled down all the rebellions in Terabon, in Amadisia, in Altara, they're still outsiders. And there are bound to be rebellions when they come into conflict. From what we know of Shan Chan history, they were always putting down rebellions in their homeland. So it's not like rebellions didn't happen. These are going to be exacerbated because they're in a new land governing people that aren't theirs. And they are outnumbered. And by the way, they're surrounded by hostile countries. Another major issue here is any imperialistic society where we've got an emperor or an empress, that's never been proven to be a form of government that lasts. There is always a lack of stability. Just look at the Roman Empire. When transfer of power from one emperor is up for grabs, basically, yeah, I want it to go to my kids, right? But when they kill each other or when they're all dead or the nation wants somebody else to rule, generals start taking over, right? When that's up for grabs, that does not lead to long-term security. Internal squabbles between the blood, the constant stream of new information into their society, and of course the loss of Damani being the foundation of their military. It's not going to be immediate, but what it means to be a Shan Chan will, will deteriorate over time, and so will their culture and their power. At the end of the Third Age, the world was already becoming smaller and smaller. And what I mean by that is with the discovery of traveling and skimming, instantaneous travel was becoming a norm, especially where channelers were involved, at least. Now that all of the major channeling groups in the world know of traveling, that's not going away anytime soon. Additionally, there are new scientific advances like steam powered trains that were rediscovered as well. And so that means goods and people can travel faster even when traveling isn't a possibility. Obviously, these advances too are going to lead to other advances. When people and scientists can get together and interact more, the libraries in all the major cities from the Dragon's Piece are a good example of that, there are going to be more scientific advances. Perhaps planes and, and cars come back. These things lead to the world being smaller and smaller and the culture becomes more and more homogeneous over time. That's not to say that everybody's going to be the same, or they're all going to look the same or act the same, but as cultures mingle, they change. Look at the United States. What we have today is an amalgamation of all these cultures, all these immigrants that have come here. Our culture today is not what it was 50 years ago, and that's going to continue to change here. That's a lot like what would happen here in the fourth age. People are going to be able to see more of the world. They're going to be able to move if they want to. There are going to be more opportunities for commerce. Think about this. If you lived in Saldea, you could visit your family in Tyr. You could t trade your goods. You could trade ice peppers one day, be in Tyr, and then be back home that night. There are in interesting vacations that can happen now. All of those are fairly massive changes to the world, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens to that world in the fourth age. I'll probably talk about this more in a future video because I think the topic is really cool. Let me quickly pause here and tell you a bit about NordVPN, the video sponsor. VPN services are absolutely vital if you are a regular user of the internet. And I'm going to assume that you are because you're watching a YouTube video on the internet. Uh, if you use online banking though, or if you travel and you use your phone while you're traveling, you need to have a VPN. It protects your web browsing from nefarious entities or even from your local internet provider because all of them track everything that you do. So this can help you stop things like identity theft. It can help people stop from seeing what you're doing on the internet or targeting you for ads. Or you ever hear those things where you mention something and all of a sudden your phone is recommending things on Facebook? A VPN can stop that. Additionally, a VPN will let you log on to the internet from a different country. So what I mean by that is, let's say you want to, you're in the UK and you want to watch American Netflix. Log into a VPN through a US server, you're going to get access to US Netflix. A VPN lets you do all that. And the great news here is that VPNs are naturally super cheap. And today you guys can get it even cheaper. 
Follow the link in the description of the video and you can get a major discount on VPN services through NordVPN and you can protect your browsing. You should definitely do that. Now we'll get back to the video. Now many might assume that the sealing of the boar and the shadow's defeat would lead to the complete end for the shadow and no one else willing to follow the dark one. And to a small degree that might be true in the form that the shadow as we see it in the books is not going to exist anymore but I do not think that's going to be the end. For one, there are still tons of dark friends left in the world. There are Forsaken left alive. Well, Gideon, while she was captured by the Shanchan, is alive. Hesalam or Grendel, though technically alive, is under heavy compulsion. Masana is alive, but her brain is mush. Who knows whether they're Masana or Grendel are gonna be put to death or not, but I, I, I would assume they would be, but who knows. But the fact that some of them are alive does lead to the possibility of the resurgence of the shadow. For instance, if a dark friend were to free Masana, it's possible that you could see her leading the remaining dark friends in her own way. There are always going to be people wanting power or people searching for eternal life. There will be people with memories of being at Sheogul, with hearing the dark Dark One speak, and while the main recruiting methods for the Shadow will be gone, as with much of its power, that doesn't mean that there's still not going to be a dedicated following. I do think, however, that being a Dark Friend in the Fourth Age will look different. It's probably going to be less like it was and more like cults dedicated to reopening the Dark One's prison or worshipping the Dark One as an entity. I think they're going to be less focused on war and conflict and more on the goal of reopening the Dark One's prison, or just worshipping him. We also don't know if all the Shadow Spawn were killed at the Sealing of the Boar, or if Trollocs and Murdral still exist. My guess is that they're actually still around, believe it or not. Because think about this, when Luce Theron sealed the Boar, the Dark One was cut off, and they still existed. Uh, I don't think that the ability to make more with the true power is there anymore, but I think that the Shadow Spawn that still existed probably still exist. So I would imagine that there was probably an effort after the last battle to go exterminate all of the remaining shadow spawn, but that doesn't mean they found them all. It's very possible there are shadow spawn still out there too. And so I think the shadow will still exist in some form. I think they will probably just be cults. So this one may seem obvious, but I'm a little torn as to where I see this going. When the last battle ends, the remainder of the Black Tower, so all of the rest of the male channelers that were trained in the Black Tower, they're seen as heroes by that group of refugees they rescued and anybody they talked to. You've got people now wanting to send their sons to learn to channel the One Power, something that was unheard of in the Third Age. Sidene is clean now, and there's leadership for the Black Tower. Loghain is firmly in charge, and he has lieutenants that provide leadership. Also, men and women have bonded each other. They've worked together. They learn to share now. They can build stuff together as channelers. All of that would seem to lead to some type of reunion between the White and Black Tower eventually. Perhaps going back to having one leader like they did in the Age of Legends. But that is exactly the reason why I don't think this is going to happen. The end of the Third Age seems to be coming to a point where it looks like the Second Age is about to happen all over again. So basically it looks like we're headed for a Second Age of Legends. That seems way too similar for it to be true. So I think this age has to be different. Because of that, I think they're going to drift into some type of a conflict rather than peace. Now that probably won't be open warfare or physical conflict, but more of a political conflict. As the Black Tower grows in influence, it's going to bring some type of a response from the White Tower, which has traditionally been the most powerful institution in the world. I think that there will be conflict for influence in certain nations. Some political maneuvering is probably gonna be going on. The Black Tower is not bound by the oaths. They're not bound by traditions, they're not bound by any laws. And so they're gonna have the ability to create their own laws and their own traditions from scratch. Now that could be a double-edged sword because in a sense, they have the freedom to create and adapt to the new realities of the world, something that the White Tower couldn't do because they're saddled with tradition and their old laws, but the Black Tower lacks the trust with many rulers that the White Tower has currently. The Black Tower could also take over a country, something the White Tower can't do. So for instance, the Black Tower might be led eventually by somebody, not Loghain, that wants to conquer a, a nation, for instance, right? They might take it over. That's something that the White Tower wouldn't do, and it would put the two of them into a conflict. Now, again, I don't feel like the signs at the end of the Third Age point to this happening, but I think if the Fourth Age is to be distinctive, I think this is a place where it could be different. I think you could have a conflict between those two channeling groups. So anyways, those are my first five things I think will happen in the Fourth Age. What do you think of my list? Do you agree? 
Do you see it differently? Do you want me to keep making more of these? Let me know in the comments of the video. Also, I wanna give a massive thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. 2020 was a rough year for everybody. And without your support, I'm honestly not sure I would still be doing this. If you enjoy the content here, please consider supporting the channel and thegreatblight.com over on Patreon. You can find that link in the description of this video. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. That's all I do here. If you want to see some non-Wheel of Time content from me, I have another YouTube channel that is brand new and it covers movie and television reviews. And of course it's called Nablus Reviews, which is very creative, right? You can find uh, that link in the video description as well. My latest video there is reviewing Wonder Woman 1984. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. Guys, thanks for watching. And until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?